you doing? <laughs> That's a little better. Welcome. We are Downtown Rotary. Um, my name is not Grace Morrison. I, in fact, am filling in for Grace Morrison, who is ill today. I am Mark DeGroff, President-Elect. So we are uh, getting a little bit of snow this winter. We are seeing occasional snowmen and lessons that we can learn from a snowman. One, getting outside in the winter is good for your health. Two, it's just fun to hang out in your front yard. Three, accessories don't have to be expensive. Four, if you look down and can't see your feet, you're probably not very active. Five, if you're a little bottom heavy, hey, that's okay. Six, in a confrontation, be creative. A handheld hairdryer can be an effective weapon. <laughs> Today is National Winnie the Pooh Day. National Winnie the Pooh Day is observed annually on January 18th, which also commemorates the 1882 birthday of the creator, A. A. Milne, who brought the adorable honey-loving bear to life in his stories, which also featured his son, Christopher Robin. The lovable Pooh Bear was inspired by a black bear named Winnie, who lived at the London Zoo during World War I. The author's son, Christopher Robin, would visit the bear often and named his own teddy bear after her, and a swan named Pooh. <clears throat> Known stories have been translated into over 50 languages. With that, let's say the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Kirk Johnson has our invocation today. <clears throat> Please join me in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you for the material blessings that you daily supply. Increase our appreciation for your gifts and move us to share generously with others. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Kirk. And Katie Brown has introductions today. remind everybody of the new way we're introducing people. I will say the name and who they're a guest of, and then pause and you can all say hi, Mark, and then we will move on. Okay, um, so Jane McCall has two guests with her. The first guest is Colleen Jameson. Hi! And her other guest is Alonzo Jameson. Hi! And David Beck has a guest with him, Diane Williams. Hi. And our speaker has three guests with her. Danny Ackerman. Oh, sorry. Hi, Hi Danny. <laughs> Tasha McClellan. Hi. And Angela Duncan. Hi, Angela. Thank you, Katie. Let's give all of our guests a big round of applause. A few quick club announcements. Um, Lee Morris is a new board member, uh, fulfilling Zach Aaron's recently uh, vacated position. So everybody please uh, congratulate Lee and when you uh, see him in person, thank him for uh, all that he puts into Rotary. So let's give Lee a round of applause. <laughs> Tom Burrell is going to come up and share a little bit of information with us now about fireside chats. <laughs> should all have on the desk a sign-up sheet for fireside chats. Uh, first of all, I want to explain what the fireside chats are and what they are not. I think in the past they've been billed as an opportunity to get together in the Rotarian's home and talk about Rotary. It's not about that. It's about getting together in the Rotarian's home and talking about yourself. Giving the uh, other members a chance to know who, a little more about you and for you to share something you'd like to share with them. Sitting around the tables at these meetings, we have, we have conversations with each other and we bring up topics and they're usually pretty, <clears throat> pretty visceral topics. How's the weather, what's the sports the news, or something we've, we've heard on the news. But this is a chance to either tell something about yourself, you'd like other people to know that they don't know already, or 
some interesting uh, hobbies maybe that you have, or uh, the whole list of <coughs> questions that could be leading questions to start the topic. Generally, we get together at a host home. Uh, everybody has a pretty equal chance to, to, to speak. And then afterwards, the host provides uh, a refreshment, you know, tea, coffee, <coughs> some light dessert, whatever. Uh, how many of you have ever been to a fireside chat? Okay, so you know what, what the routine is. Those of you that haven't, uh, it's really a great opportunity. It's, it's a fun evening. It's a chance to get to know people in a little different, little different way. It's, you know, we have uh, business meetings after hours. We have cocktail hours and that type of thing. But this, uh, these are just fun. It's nobody's home. Now the sheet that you have has dates on it. Those dates were picked in February because there are no KU or K State ball games on those days. I don't know about any other games, but those are those are free. But today, if you can at least sign up, it doesn't matter what date you sign up for now. If you can sign up, we're particularly interested in coming up with some hosts. Once we have hosts that can sign up for certain days, then you'll be able to sign up for specific days and specific hosts. But if you would at least put your name down if you're interested, don't worry about what date it is, <clears throat> or if you're interested in a host, we appreciate it and that would get the ball rolling. So, thank you. Thank you, Tom. Rotary Leadership Institute is coming up. Uh, that's going to be in Manhattan. That's painful for some of us and fun for some of us. Stan, Mark, Dale, and I are both planning on going and maybe carpooling. Uh, so please join us if uh, that's anything of interest to you. We would uh, highly recommend the quality of programming uh, that they do at the uh, Leadership Institute. February 10th, March 3rd, and April 7th are those dates. You can register uh, through a link on our website. The fee is $55. That includes a lunch. Uh, each of the three days, and there are scholarships available if anybody would like to attend. Um, next up, we have Terry Hobbs with the Blue Badge presentation. Of Thank you, Tom. pleasure to you know to welcome you new members of our club you've done a lot to achieve your red badge which is introducing people which you did today and being a reader and bringing a new member and, and all of the qualifications it takes to become a blue badge, blue badge member to help introduce them to everything different things that we do so Rotary is an international organization of business, and we look forward to having you do so many things with us. Um, Katie is a skin care salesperson and also works at Washburn. She is in the field of Rodan Fields skin care, so you can always talk to her about that too. But I'd like to welcome Katie into the blue badge, and we're so pleased to have you, Katie. Let me put this, well, right here, okay. All right, you can do it better than okay. I. And, and help me welcome Katie. Congratulations, Katie. And now Lee Morris will introduce our speaker for the day. <laughs> a 
Well, along with the privilege of introducing our guest speaker for today, I want to also make you aware of another upcoming opportunity uh, for your involvement. That is our Rotary Mentoring Project, which will also involve efforts at Highland Park High School. Uh, there are on your table cards, so if you know at this point that you're definitely interested in doing that, we'd like you to go ahead and make that registration so that we can do that. We're planning on February the 28th, which is a Wednesday, uh, with the time frame that works with the school schedule, approximately 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., that we're going to have our first actual mentoring meet each other event. So if you're able to do that, we would very much welcome you, invite you to take part in that. We'll be getting more information out to you in the next couple of weeks so that you have a lot more data to inform you about that. Our speaker today is Shana Perry. Shana's been an active educator for 21 years, teaching at both the elementary and the secondary levels. She's worked in urban, low socioeconomic status schools, suburban middle class schools, as well as in Darmstadt, Germany, where she worked for the Department of Defense. She has served as a school administrator now for 11 years and is currently the proud principal at Highland Park High School. Shana remains an active member of many professional and community organizations, including the NAESP, the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She's passionate about student learning and student success and their achievement, and she summarizes her philosophy saying, if it is for the benefit of the students, Shana will do it. In every decision she makes, the student is the center. She is known for her high expectations, her diverse <coughs> methods of teaching, for developing rapport with all stakeholders, and for motivating students to set goals, to make plans, and to reach those goals, and then move through that process again. She reports that she is all but her dissertation, completing on her doctoral work with an anticipated defense of that dissertation in the spring of 2018 at my alma mater, Oklahoma State. So, Shana wears many titles, but she also readily admits that her favorites are those of wife and mother. So please join me in giving a warm rotary welcome to Shana Perry. Val, I heard that this maybe isn't normally your job, and so I want to tell you right now <laughs> that I have a little bit of, um, or a lot, of adult onset of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So I'm going to be moving around, so, so you're going to have to try to well, keep up. And while Dr. Duncan is helping me um, get, get ready, if you didn't fill out a mentoring card, that's okay, because by the time I'm through, you will. And so I'll go ahead and get you started um, just with a little bit of some things that I do. I am a serious child. I am a serious child with serious goals. My life is destined to be filled with positivity. I am a worker. If it takes hard work to reach my goals, I will do it. I'm a clean somebody. I know that if I lie down with hogs, I can come up with mud. So I will work to keep my mind, my body, and my character clean. I am intelligent. My brain is a storage place, and I will fill it to the brim with knowledge and look forward with hope of what tomorrow will bring. <laughs> I am a child hero. I don't spend time wasting time because I know that there is room at the top for me. I am the greatest somebody there is. So start leading me now, teachers. Start guiding me now, teachers. Start praising me now, teachers. And you will see me rise to the highest heights. That is a recitation called A Great Somebody by Adrian Seely Hardesty. And I remember embarking on my very first time to walk across the threshold into a classroom full of third graders and already having this memorized because my expectation is that they do the same. And so their homework each day was to memorize just a little bit of it. And we're gonna call that a stanza. So I'm using those words with third graders in an inner city project area that was a school that was opening for the first time. And I happened to be a brand new first year teacher that got to be in there. I was so excited. I really didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> um, it, was, it was built on 
the hollow ground of where Section 8 housing had been built, destroyed, erected again, and destroyed, and they put a school on that ground. And we brought students from all over Oklahoma City. I heard y'all doing your KU and your K-State, and which, I don't want to miss anybody, Wichita State, and I was worried when he said Oklahoma State, somebody was going to boo me. And so, but that's all right, because we got Mr. Kruger, and y'all got Mr. Seth. And so, we're, we're going to trade some stuff. And so, anyway, for me, when I think about spending time wasting time, or instead of at the end when I say, start leading me now, teachers, I'm going to say, start leading me now, mentors, start guiding me now, teachers, start guiding me now, mentors. I'm going to put you in that position because our students, they need you now more than they have ever needed you before. And I knew that was my responsibility. So I'm going to start just by showing you, for those who might feel like, man, I don't want to sign that card. I don't want to be in that. I'd rather go to the cocktail hour or, that y'all said y'all have. <laughs> if you would have invited me to that, I would have brought more. <laughs> but, but just know that everyone is a mentor, and everyone should have at least one mentor. Mentorship in 501 is extremely powerful in the fact that they're making personal connections. And so employees within the district are connecting with kids that they care about. Of course, I would definitely recommend this program to other students because all of our mentors are 501 employees, so they have that personal bond with us students in the 501 district. The biggest takeaway I got from the mentor program is that they're someone that you can talk to about anything. I didn't like really talk to before, like I never knew that I would be connected and have so much in common with somebody. Uh, one benefit I had from the mentorship program is that uh, my mentor, uh, the Donald, he uh, just made, made sure that I was on top of my grades and uh, stayed on me about my physical grade because it was my lowest grade and made sure I kept it up and kept getting it up. Well, my first friend of Ron Sides was pretty cool. He just kind of talked about himself and what he went through and how he got to where he was at today, how he felt that that could contribute to what I'm trying to attain. We actually have each other's phone numbers, and so once in a while we would text each other and see how we're doing. With the kickoff being very um, close to their Black Kansas Day, um, they were able to stay and assist in making sure that students were you know, filling out college applications. And although many of our students really know how to do that, having someone right behind them as accountability and support and encouragement um, is, is really huge. I've never had a mental work team. I'd like to have one throughout the whole period to help me with getting through it and keep on track. So. so after school, I would like to be somewhere in the accounting field, CPA, cost accounting, or forensic After high school, I want to go to K-State to do the business program and become an accountant. And then say, come on. And then that, that take give, give me some more time to talk to you. And so, so for me, becoming formalized is a little bit of a struggle for me <clears throat> because I want to be able to relate. I want to be able to make those connections. So instead of my introduction, you will actually see what the production is that I'm giving to you when I come before you. And so I want to tell you a little bit about my story, because that formal education piece has a lot less to do with me and a lot more to do with others who <coughs> made deposits into my spiritual life, who made deposits into my academic life, who made deposits even into my physical life growing up as a young person and continue to do that as an adult. So I stand here today looking good and smelling good, thank you, because nobody even said, oh my goodness, you've been an educator for 21 years? Yes, good moisturizer and good, <laughs> and good scotch. 
And so, anyway, so, so for me, I've had lots of depositors, although I've had some withdrawals in my life. If I ask you right now, who's your favorite teacher and why? Someone immediately comes to your mind. The smell that they had or the way they made you feel, not the way they were good at instructing a lesson. It was about making a connection with you. But in that very same moment, you can pick a few of those. Some only one. My husband and I attended, attended the same schools all the way from sixth, seventh grade through high school, and he could not name one. <coughs> Went to the same school. People were not making deposits into his life because his outward behavior was not drawing them in. You know, his outward behavior should have been drawing them in. I was easy. Because I was a pleaser. Because I was hiding things. Because I stand here today fully make up and got my ends trimmed and got my nails done because I know I'm coming to talk to y'all. And so, but my mother did that. At 60 years old is still a PCP addict. <coughs> today. I was an only child. I come from, um, I'm biracial. My father is Caucasian and my mother is African American. I grew up hiding who she was and what she was doing because I needed to take care of her. I had adult responsibilities at eight and nine years old. But I didn't want to leave her side because I knew my dad would take me somewhere else. But although he's Caucasian, both of my parents achieved a GED. Both of them did. I have, I've had three stepmothers in my life as well, and some step-siblings that have come and gone in my life. I remember what it was like to have industrial jugs. My grandmother used to uh, be a, a maid and, and clean the Holiday Inn rooms and I remember she somehow had these industrial jugs. And I remember using water from the industrial jugs to flush the toilet and to bathe and to brush my teeth so that I looked good at school so I wouldn't be taken away from somebody because we had no water. I remember when there was the Phillips 66 and we used to have the Big 8. Y'all remember that? We had the Big 8. And I always remember, I didn't really remember it was Phillips 66. I knew more about basketball and the Big 8. And I remember that I would go into the restroom that was detached from the Phillips 66 where you would go in and pay. And I remember going into the restroom after I would get off the bus and I remember stealing toilet paper so that I would have it at night. But I say I stand here alone not because of me. I stand here because of others who invested in me, who saw my work, who saw the pain, because although I thought I was masking it, some people saw it. And the reason I knew about the big is because of a lady named Donna Anderson. She was the spouse of one of the assistant coaches under Billy Tubb. That's why I knew about the big eight. That was in my mind. That's why I knew. I'm a basketball girl, right? And so, so she was married to an assistant coach, and I remember she wasn't married to me at first. She was, she was just building a relationship with me. She provided me with gymnastics <laughs> lessons after school that were free. She would take me home because my mother worked in the morning. Worked at, she worked at a drive-in theater in the evening sometimes. And she also worked at a liquor store, and he owned both. And, um, and then she was going to school. So, so Donna Anderson was my PE teacher. And she made a connection with me because I was really athletic. But I also had a lot of staff. Y'all can't even imagine. I know. I know. You can't even imagine me at eight years old, right? And so for, for her, she saw me and she invested in me. I know she probably was somebody else's favorite teacher, and she was multiplying her skill set and her love. And she wasn't dividing it because I really thought I had it all. Because I had her. I knew what middle class was because she took me to her house to spend the night. I knew what middle class was because I was sent to Ada, Oklahoma with one of my other teachers to watch her get married. I remember when Mike 
Anderson used to come uh, to, the, to the school when he was courting her. And I was like, I don't know if I like him. And then I got to go to the game. And I was like, I think I like him. <laughs> and so, so anyway, she was someone who invested in me. And so my journey has not been by myself. And I'm so fortunate, I didn't just have Donna Anderson. I had Jerry Rickards. I had Celeste Scott. I had Marguerite Ross Dunbar. I had Betty Ivages. I had so many people who believed in me and invested in me, and any construction people know construction. We use this word in education too called scaffolding. We kind of build these support systems <coughs> around the structure so that we can either make repairs or erect it so that it can stand on its own. And so today I am thankful for the people who made up the scaffolding around Shana Blanchard, young Shana Blanchard, and now soon to be Dr. Perry. They are going to be on my ray, not my timeline, because I still got more to do. They are going to be a spot on the ray of who Dr. Shana Perry is becoming. And they are part of me investing in other people's lives. And so one day I sat at tables just like this, but the chairs were a little smaller because I felt it was like one or two more chairs that could be at the table. And I was in this really, really big place, and Jerry Rickards was my high school principal. And he said, Shana, you are going to be a part of an organization called Student to Student. I said, huh, what is that? He said, you're going to have to leave school every week, and you're going to have to go to the elementary, and you're going to match up in the classroom with the kiddo. He is implanting mentorship in me at 16 years old. Who, what, me? I get to go? I didn't want to go. Because I got basketball practice, and I got all these honors classes, and they call them AP then. I had all these honors classes, and I had to do homework, and I got to do school lockers, so I get a discount. And so I got stuff to do. Mr. Rickard, I don't really want to do that. He said, that's OK. You don't have to volunteer. You just have to be voluntold. And you are going <laughs> to the door. And so I was like, Shana, you have to understand, there are many children who look like you who need to see you. They need to hear you speaking in complete sentences. They need to see you giving back. They need to see you coming alongside them and being a positive role model for them. Notice during the time, again, I'm giving away my age when Charles Barkley was saying, I'm no role model. Yeah, you a role model whether you want to be or not. You're demonstrating something. And so I was voluntold to do this activity. <clears throat> oh, I was so mad. And then I had to leave school for this all-day in-service training. I know what in-service is now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all day, and this is, they're getting ready to start. And some person, not as enthusiastic as me, got up on a, a, a microphone. This was the whole district of leaders who were becoming mentors and giving back. In this room, so it was, I don't know how many, but it was a full, like, it was the first church of the Nazarene, big place, and it was a big center. I don't remember how, I can't even imagine. It was full. And we're sitting there, and I'm closed. I'm closed. I'm mad about it. This was not my decision. I didn't volunteer for this. I was about to And so suddenly, <coughs> these people came out with trays, and on the trays, and I'm glad that there are enough people in here that are close enough in age to understand the significance of this, that had trays that had paper and a box of 64 Crayolas with the sharpener. And so that was a big deal for me when I was a kid. Because remember, I don't have water. I don't have toilet paper. And so that, when I saw it, I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is interesting. And so he begins to talk, and he says, close your eyes. And I want you to think about an elementary school adult that made a difference in your life. And I'm 16, and here's when I know that I have a spirit of giving. Tears are running down my face, and I am so, like, I'm emotional because I'm thinking and seeing the picture of Donna Anderson in my view. I hadn't seen her since I was about 12 years old. That was a long time then. So I was trying to find her. I needed, I needed to figure out how to find her. And I'm drawing and I'm crying. And I am in. Thank you, Mr. Rickards, for doing this for me. Thank you, because this is 
what I know I'm supposed to do. When someone grows up and they close their eyes, I want to be that person that they think about. And so I told my daddy. And he said, no, you're not. You're going to be broke. But I am emotionally rich. I am emotionally rich. Because when I'm making deposits into other people's accounts, at the very same moment, they are being made back into my own emotional bank account. Part of my dissertation, somebody check me on time. Um, um, so, so part of my dissertation, it, it talks about African American outliers. That is my focus. African American in, the, in this country, on every assessment that is given nationally, are the lowest achieving on every single standard. It doesn't matter if you put a wealthy with wealthy and all the different dem uh, uh, demography up there with them. African American is still the lowest. If you go to the very bottom, same, lowest. And so I thought, man, I know I am an excellent educator. So I think I already know the idea of this, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some research. So I took the highest achieving adults who were African American, who came from the worst circumstances, kind of like me, <coughs> right? And so I looked into them, and these people are attorneys. They are pediatricians. They are professors. They are doing all kinds of amazing things. And, and so I, I get to where they're going, and y'all can read about it later, because I'm going to get done. And then, because I cannot have ABD, I think I'm going to have a new psychiatrist for that if I don't finish. And so, and so, so then, at the, at the end, but as I'm moving through this process, one of the questions I ask them is, what does success mean to you? And I was really expecting the achievements, kind of that formalized thing, because that, that makes me uncomfortable. That formalized thing that you national <coughs> top three finalist principal of the year, all that, that kind of stuff, kind of makes me feel weird. I want to list the name of kids. It's not Googleable. It says, these are my kids that I've had a difference in their lives. But every single one of them starts by saying, you know, it's not about money. It's not about titles or the degrees. I mean, they hang on the wall so that I can do my job. It's about impacting the lives of other people. Every single one of them said it. And I went, oh man, John Maxwell says there's a difference between success and significance. Success is what you do to make deposits into your own life. Significance is what you do to make an impact on the lives of others. But if you are doing this one, you will feel successful. So they will match. They will come together. And so we have a great mentoring program at our school. Dr. Anderson, our superintendent, who was involved in recruiting me to be in Topeka. Do y'all know that I live above the Celtic Fox? They have scotch. I live above them in a loft. But my husband works in Oklahoma City. He is a teacher and a basketball coach. My daughter's a senior in high school. She's a senior class president. She is a competitive swimmer. She's used to walking into a room like this and being one of the only people of color. You understand? I'm teaching her this resilience and that you have a place in the room. You have a voice in the room. You have a stance. Because I was able to get on someone else's shoulders. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for making those deposits into my life. And so I drive sometimes on Monday mornings when the weather is good, because it hasn't been in a while, and you have to avoid deer. And so, <laughs> and so I usually wake up at 2.30 in the morning in Oklahoma City and drive here on Monday, because I've got to be with my family on the weekend. I've got to make sure I'm giving to them. And I drive in and take a nap at the, the, the McDonald's at the <coughs> Emporia, after Emporia, and then I take like 50, I can power nap, y'all. This, this don't come natural. I got to, like, you know, get a little bit of a moment. And then I go on to work. Okay. But I am not dividing who I am. I am committed to this community. I am committed to these students. I am committed to the stakeholders. I am committed to the teachers. Because I know my purpose. And it's my intent to walk in it every day. And there's some people in this room that tell me that I sing. 
talk to Faith Hood, but they know I sing, so they expect me to sing here. Y'all didn't, you didn't know I can recite though. I got my own words here. I got my own words. And so, I don't, and then I'm glad that you all started with a word of prayer. And uh, one of my friends is the Rotary president, and Edna um, is actually his wife is really my friend. I mean, I have to put up with him. And so he was in charge. I was like, is it going to be okay? Because, like, my song this week is this and, you know, whatever. And so I, I, I'm, I've been given the gift of song. That, that one from my <coughs> It's just given to me. And I really know that part of that is ministering to others. But also part of that is ministering to myself. And so even in my, very, in my interview, two people who were here were in my interview, I said, when children are acting up, like my husband did when we were in school, he sure was cute. <laughs> and so, um, but, but those kids that pop out in your mind, those that pop out in the classroom that you sat in that were squirrels, and you go, I wonder what's going on with them now. Or you know what's going on with them now. They got showing up at the reunions, right? Because they got some other stuff going on in their lives. If nobody fooled me, and mentor them. But I said, when kids act up, really what they're saying is, I need you now. I need you now. I need you now. I need you now. Not another second or another minute. Not another hour or another day. Mentors with my arms outstretched. I need you right away. I need you now. I need you now. And so when you get to that, when you can look at Undercover High, and instead of putting their face, put mine. We're talking about social media over here and bullying. I can't tell you how many emails anonymously I have received from people who think I'm Dr. them <laughs> that say terrible things. Adults are demonstrating this behavior to our children. Watch a news article about the highest death rate in Topeka. Read an article about that and then read the comments at the bottom. That's adult behavior. Children are watching, you're mentoring, you're a role model, whether you like it or not. But you can choose to be matched, and you can come in the comfort of our school, and you can do it once a month, come into our building with other people in our district who have taken just one. And then you can email that student or text message them and see how their college scholarship thing is going. Or you can say, I want to sit next to you to make sure that your grammar is appropriate for the application for a scholarship. You can make sure that you remember that it's somebody's birthday because oftentimes theirs are forgotten. You can make sure they have toilet paper. You can connect them with the right services, the wraparound services. And so although sometimes I just want to wrap around some of them, <laughs> I just just see their faces and know that you can do it. And later on, they will be doctor somebody. They'll be caretaker somewhere. They're going to be somebody's <coughs> mom. There's going to be somebody's daddy. And just remember, they were somebody's greatest hope and they took them home from the hospital. And then at the end, they'll come back and say, like I did with Donna Anderson, never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. And now I see how you were there for me. And I say, never would have made it. Never could have made it without you. I would have lost it all. And now I see how you were there for me. And I'm stronger, and I'm wiser, I'm better, so much better. And when I look back over all you brought me through, I realize I had you to hold on to, and I say never, never would have made it.
Shannon, thank you for sharing your story. What an inspirational message. Uh, it is an honor for our club to work with you and your staff. And uh, there are some great things happening in our community, folks. And uh, for those to continue and for that snowball to grow and grow, uh, we need to invest. And it's an investment of time and other resources. Uh, Sheena, instead of giving you a, a dumb speaker's pen or something else, uh, we give you a rotary four-way coin. And you embody that service above self in so many ways. So we'd like to give that to you uh, to remind you of uh, what we see in you. Um, enjoy this and then pass it on to somebody that you see later. We also donate books to uh, Ross Elementary. And so we would ask that you would sign the books like here. And we'll donate that in your honor to Ross Elementary. Thank you very much. Um, I know uh, the next two presidents after Grace um, are fully supportive of the mentor program and fill out our cards. Um, if your heart wasn't moved by what she shared, I can tell you that there are evidence-based studies that you will live longer if you volunteer. The catch is you have to volunteer with the heart of a servant. You cannot volunteer to live longer. And what she shared is absolutely true and it is now documented by science. You will live longer if you volunteer. And uh, it, uh, we see it over and over again when we uh, get back. And we believe in service above self in this group. And regularly are people who get back in the community and we get more out of it than we uh, put in uh, frequently. So thank you. Next week, um, where will we be next week, Linda? Uh, back to Capitol Plaza. We're back at Capitol Plaza Hotel next week. Our program is Benjamin Gardner from the Highway Patrol, and he's going to be discussing social media and the Highway Patrol. Um, Grace will also be out of town next week, so you get me again. Um, we uh, will finish on this inspirational quote and then our four-way test. Henry Ford once said, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. With that, let's uh, finish with the four-way test plus one. Of the things you think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Is it fun? Thank you all. Have a great weekend.